hello guys and welcome back to my youtube channel life in life i'm very excited to have you here my name is jonathan Thu, and i will be your host for today now what are we talking about today today we are talking about space but before we get into today's episode i'd just like to shout out um, some of my friends and the people who've been consuming this particular videos guys my intention was to shoot at least 10 videos and then share them and then post them and then i can share them apparently that was not to be <laughs> i've got really good and supportive friends who've been really sharing feedback with me they've already started watching these videos they've shared these videos with their friends and i'm so grateful to them thank you for the feedback thank you for um being active listeners and watching this particular youtube channel as well i'm very grateful for the inspiration and the encouragement that you've shared with me so i am deeply honored that i have such an amazing audience watching this and i just like to say thank you thank you one hour is not like <laughs> a short period of time to go through something so i'm really grateful for that um amongst the feedback that i got was the idea that this video is too long so do share with me um since now we share this video we upload this video um twice a month so once every two weeks so if it's okay with you do share it with me in the comments if it would if you would prefer us sharing maybe 30 minutes so cutting the video into half and then we share a video every week so maybe that would be that would work much better for you but as you share that with me, please also share more feedback that you have. I'm really grateful. I'm learning and oh God, I am so grateful for the feedback. I am grateful. I'm deeply grateful, guys. Thank you very much. So Gibran, Melissa, Cynthia, Jean, and all my other friends, I want to say thank you to you for taking the time to just go through this, to give me your honest review and feedback, and at the same time, to be compassionate enough to share this with your friends. Okay. I think we are done now with the nitty gritty, so we'll get into it. So today's episode is called, um, it's episode four, and it's called Space, Where Order Begins. And it's very important for us to understand this. And even before we get into space, first let's look at something very interesting that I came across. And this is non-verbal cues or non-verbal communication. It's often very assumed. I would say that when we communicate, when I say something to you, all that you capture and all that you attain is what I say to you, right? But it's ideally and particularly not the case. So out of every conversation that goes on, it's only 40% that is attributed to the verbal communication. 60% of what you share with people in a conversation is non-verbal. So it can be like, an eyebrow has been raised, it can be a wink, it can be a smile, it can be a frown, it can be you trying to touch the back of your neck, it can be just you leaning in to listen to this person. So these are non-verbal cues and non-verbal communication and they account for 60%, 60% of what we are able to communicate to other human beings within a conversational uh, situation. So it's very important for us to be aware, to be aware of the nonverbal communication and cues that you are giving other people, right? So let's get into it, nonverbal communication, and we'll see how this leads into um, our particular topic of the day. So nonverbal communication, um, where do we begin? Number one, now that you understand that nonverbal communication only um, attests to 60% of our conversation, then how can we understand it better, right? So there's this uh, kid who was born in the United States of America. This kid joined what here in Kenya under the 844 system we call primary school. So in primary school or during the primary school experience of this kid, uh, this particular boy was so interested in what people do, the actions that their body do, uh, that they do not communicate verbally, right? And he was so interested in this because he wanted to understand why people do certain things that are so weird, like why people have smile or uh, raise both of their eyebrows or um, touch somewhere on their head or neck or whatever. What does that mean? And why do people do that? And is it something that everyone does or is it something that is very limited to a certain number of people? So 
this particular boy decided to come up with a journal, right? So to write down what he observes, his observations in how people act in a journal, right? To journal it down. And um, he did that through his whole primary school experience and then he went to high school. He also did the same thing. So by the time he was graduating through high school as a gentleman, he had a journal, like a proper journal of like um, gist <laughs> on how our body snitches on us through nonverbal communication. So he could tell you that, hmm, so if someone say does this, if someone is protecting their head using their, their palms or, or their, their hands, it's basically to say that they're in a state where they feel uh, stressed or they feel under pressure. And so they're trying to comfort themselves by trying to protect the most critical part of their body, which is their head. So essentially that sort of thing. So he would uh, list down a couple of observations and then after some time he would try to decipher the observations that he found were most common amongst people. And by the time he was joining university, well, he did a course related to human behavior. And by the time he was graduating, this guy was onboarded onto the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in America. Now, if you know FBI or if you know something about the FBI is that they tackle hard criminals. They tackle the, the best of the best in terms of criminals in the US, right? Um, so where then was this particular gentleman placed within the FBI structure? So he was placed under um, the, the department that helps the, the, the bureau to get information from people. And so for him, since his specialization was in nonverbal cues, he was easily able to, com to, to get that communication from your body that your mouth doesn't share. You get. So um, by the time he was retiring from the FBI, he did us a great service and wrote a book called The Dictionary of Body Language. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to understand human habits and nonverbal cues to a level that you have never done before, look for this book, The Dictionary of Body Language. And if I'm not mistaken, the writer's name is Joe Navarro. I read this book a few years ago, so if I've butchered that name, please uh, share the correct name with me in the comments. But essentially, this is the idea that there are certain cues, there are certain actions that our body part participates in that um, essentially uh, communicate something to someone else without us knowing or with us knowing, but uh, without us having to say anything, right? So it's, it's, it's quite an interesting um, situation to think about. And I'll steal you a couple of, of, um, of things and cues that he mentions in his book. The first thing that Joe Navarro mentions um, within his book, something that can tell you so much about someone even before you have a conversation with them, and this is someone's hair. Yes, someone's hair. Someone's hair can tell you a whole lot about this person even before you have a physical conversation or a verbal conversation with this person. And how can that, can your hair betray you or say, communicate something about you? So think about it this way. Let's say you meet someone in the street. This is someone who has really well done hair. It looks healthy. It looks dark if it's black. It looks its original color, it's just deep in color, it's deep in like goodness, it just looks glossy and shiny, well taken care of, it's strong, it's long, You, it just looks healthy, right? So if you find someone who has very good hair, that has been kept up to date, up to standard, up to par with the quality that is expected within their social setting, then this tells you that this person is really interested in fitting in. This person is really interested in being accepted by the social body and being socially connected to other human beings. And they'll take care of themselves. They'll make sure that they're in a proper state for them to be able to have a conversation, to engage, or to be accepted into the social body, right? On the flip side, if you find someone who has unkempt hair, this hair is looking pale, it's looking weak, it's broken down, you're finding someone's hair is just messy and shaggy and it doesn't look like it's had any 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 sort of um care and life taken uh taken into it 
um, you'll find that maybe this is someone who is really stressed. This is someone who taking care of their hair is the last thing on their mind. They have so many other things that are stressing them in life that it's, it's not their top priority to take care of their hair. Yeah? And even think about that. You might find, say, it can be street kids. You might find maybe it can be people who have so much on their plate. Um, it can be people who don't even have the time of day. You have like two, three kids. You need to take care of them. You have one on the arm. You have one time pulling on your trouser. You have another one in a stroller. You are in a supermarket trying to pay for things and your phone. You can't even find your phone. You, you like, they're in a state of, for lack of a better word, stress. They're in a state of stress such that they haven't even taken the time to consider uh, making their hair so that they can sort of quote-unquote fit into society, right? So this in itself shows you so much about, or tells you so much about, number one, the mental state that someone is in based on the quality of their hair, right? And, and um, so this is not like a fully um, explanatory uh, situation, right? So there might be... Someone might be wearing a wig or a wig. I, I don't know the difference, God, but that coffee one, <laughs> the one that they had. Someone might be wearing that and you might not know, yeah? But essentially, if someone is taking care of their hair, it means that they're in a proper, at least a proper state of mind, yeah? And, and, and life as well, right? Um, but at the same time, if someone has completely neglected their hair, then that tells you a lot about this person. Either they're going through a difficult time in their life or it's just been hard for them right it's stressful for them so that is the in in itself an example of a non-verbal communication or cue right um or body language in itself um think about a non-verbal cue now uh to be more specific so imagine you're telling someone a story and then they're like <laughs> and then it's they, they scoff and then they smile from the edge of one side of their face why is that um why is that a little bit off right it's a little bit off because it shows um, or it tries to communicate something that's in line with this person thinking that they're better than you or they have certain information that you do not know and that makes them that puts them at a su more superior point of view uh, as compared to you right so that's why they'll scoff and then they'll 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 show contentment is it contentment i think so they'll show contentment through like a smack on their faces like mm. so that's what you think about life could be more wrong <laughs> but they're not saying that right it's 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 evident in their face right another aspect of body language that can really help you to understand someone even before you have a conversation with them is this stress lines right stress lines so if someone has stress lines on their face it more or less shows that they've been through a very difficult or stressful period of time in their life, right? If, again, someone does not have stress lines or stress marks here, then that shows that, uh, well, their life is a bit okay because they are not constantly <gasps> shocked or stressed or the, the physical representation of stress in their life is not being seen on their face, okay? So then that shows you, again, people who are in two very different uh, states of mind based on how their body language looks, right? The last one, the last one, um, <laughs> I'm going to share this and please, ladies, please, please, um, this is a secret that I'm going to share with you. Please do not misuse it. Please do not misuse this power that I'm sharing with you. Now, a hair flip. A hair flip is, and <laughs> it, it, it's quite interesting because there's, I think there's research that has been done into this, right? A hair flip is one of those things that will attract someone's attention um, from across the room, even if they were not looking at you. A hair flip is one of those activities that pulls and attracts someone's attention from even across the street, right? So it's one of those things that is, I think it's hot wired into our heads. But um, you might be in a conference with 100 people and then there's just a lady somewhere at the corner of your eye who just... You guy, you will, you will notice. You will notice. Trust you me, even if you're in a conversation with someone else and they do that at, your, at the corner of your eye, you will notice. You will notice. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing how um, keen our body is to certain, certain activities going on around us, even without our knowledge, right? 
Um, the last one is, okay, so I shared a snippet and then now this last one. So if you see someone trying to shield any part of their head, so you see someone sitting like this, you see someone sitting like this, see someone like this, or even trying to air the back of their neck, this is someone who is particularly stressed because your head is the most um, sensitive, I'd say, part of your body, your body organ. So any single time that you put your hands in a way that looks like it's protecting your head, then it's like you're trying to shield yourself from the stress that is within your head. You're trying to shield yourself from the pressure that you're feeling. And for ladies, mostly because they have long hair, whenever they're stressed, they tend to either to create some certain room between their neck and their hair so that air can come in, cool air. They want to cool the back of their necks because either they're stressed or they're feeling fearful or there's just something that is making them uncomfortable, okay? So it's very important for you to notice this, right? So then why am I sharing with you about non-verbal cues and body language? What, 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 what the hell does that have to do with your space and what is space in itself? So the idea of sharing with you about nonverbal cues is so that we can be able to understand that people can be able to tell so much about us and our mental state and our physical state based on how we look, which is our physical attributes within our body. And not only that, but also where we are, like our space, right? So if people can tell, for example, can approximate the state of mind that you're in based on your hair, then what do you think they can tell about your state of mind based on your bedroom? <laughs> right? So I remember a while back, I shared this as a tweet on Twitter and I was like, we really underestimate how much information our bedroom tells other people about us. We really do that. And why am I talking about the bedroom? Um, first of all, because that is the most intimate space that most of us have, right? This is where you spend ideally most of your time in your day, apart from, say, work. This is the one room where you spend most of your time any single day continuously because that's where you sleep, that's where you um, change your clothes, so you are naked again. This is somewhere where you're naked. <laughs> At least once a day, I, I'd hope, because that means that you, you shower. Um, yeah. So there's that. So it's where uh, you sleep, it's where you are most vulnerable, it's your cradle of living. Number two, it's where you're naked. Number three, it's where most of the things that you need to live in terms of like your clothes and all that are. And number four, so it houses, it homes your protective armor for showing up every single day. And number four, it's where most of us have sex. Oh God, I hope my parents are not watching this. Um, so, <laughs> so if you're sexually active, um, you understand that sex is one of the most vulnerable things that you can do as a human being. It's, it's opening yourself up to another human being. It's, it's not even something that you do. It's somewhere that you go. You, you, you unlock a certain version of you that you do not display out, out, outside to every single other person, right? You, you, you showcase a certain identity or a certain personality or a certain... Yeah, you, you showcase a certain personality that is you that is not what you show other people or what you show outside there, right? It's it's somewhere that you go, either to evoke that inner boy in you or that inner girl in you. It's somewhere that you go maybe to 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 become that dominant person who it's not generally who you are in, in everyday life. It's where you go to become that timid, that relaxed, that oh, submissive person who probably is not who you are every day out there, right? So it's somewhere where through vulnerability and through it being a safe space, you are able to achieve your most intimate um, level of identity, right? And so think about the space where that happens. Think about that space. A space where you feel safe enough to show your nakedness. And nakedness is vulnerability, ladies and gentlemen. Nakedness is vulnerability. You don't have any armor. Anything can hurt you. Now people are seeing everything about you, your A to Z, right? So imagine the space where that happens and how important that space is to you. And so this is why the bedroom is so important to you. The bedroom is, is like your bedrock of, 
of like every day existence. That is why you originate from every day and you go back to at the end of every day, right? So the bedroom is one of your most fundamental spaces that that, that you'll, you'll own or you it will be your sphere of influence within your existence here, here on this planet. So, then why does the idea of your space relate very importantly to your mind? And the reason why your space is very important to the, the, the mental state that you're in is because physical clutter or clutter in your physical space is a manifestation of chaos in your mind. Just as we have seen that clutter within your head space, for example, with your hair, is, um, is, a, is an indication of chaos in your mind or your life, then the same thing applies to your most intimate space. That clutter in your space is a physical manifestation of chaos in your mind. If you walk into your bedroom and everything is in a haywire state, you have your clothes in a pile, the clean and the dirty are mixed up, you have your bed looking like a wreck, you have your makeup products or your skincare products all over the place, you have dishes and cups under the bed, it just looks like chaos, then it's a physical manifestation of the chaos in your mind. And I know some people might not want to hear that, but it's the truth. And so let's try to unpack this a little bit more, right? Let's, let's try to see then, okay, so there's chaos. Yeah, chaos is a part of life. And just in case you didn't know, chaos and order are the two most prevailing um, energies or states of existence in our life and even beyond our life. Like this existence of, of, of nature and of life in itself is a repetitive sequence of chaos and order, chaos and order, chaos and order. Order comes out of chaos, chaos comes out of order. Order comes 